Good morning, everyone. Good morning to all of you who are online and watching, and we appreciate you being there. This is the Revelation class at Christ Church Anglican, and today we are doing chapter 17 and 18. So if you will turn um, either to your Bible or your phone and look up the uh, English Standard Version of chapter 17, and please mute your phone. He's trying. <laughs> and while you're doing that, while you're getting there, I'm going to read to you the quote for this chapter from Teresa. The world is on fire. Men try to, to, to condemn Christ once again. They would raise his church to the ground. No, my sisters, this is no time to treat with God for things of little importance. <laughs> All right, let's start. Chapter 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly, but the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind of wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those, who, those with him are called and chosen and faithful. And the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. 
They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire, for God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled and the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. The word of the Lord. Well, is that clear? <laughs> Ooh, that's pretty confusing. So let's break it down. So we start with one of the bowl angels who had poured out plagues on the earth in the last chapter. He comes out of the heavenly temple and he shows John another vision, and then he explains it to him. And you're thinking, wait, he explained it? Uh, yeah, actually he did. So the imagery is of a prostitute, or as some versions call, the great whore. And that is uh, representative of the city of Babylon, which is what it is called, but it is more deeply symbolic of the city of Rome. The great whore is covered in luxury and expensive jewels. These are not expensive <laughs> jewels, but some of them are pretty good. Um, I pulled them out of my drawer this morning. She was covered in expensive jewels. She relaxed on the, be on the beast. She was at ease on him. Who is the beast? He is the Antichrist. She drinks the blood of the martyrs from a gold cup. And her forehead is branded with the words that the angel said was a mystery. We recall that we've also looked at someone who had a brand on his head, and that, of course, was the high priest, holy to the Lord, holy to Yahweh. And, and we've been sealed as well on the forehead. So in a mockery of the sealing of God, the whore is also sealed on her forehead. And it reads, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. What a title. But John's initial reaction to her is not disgust. He marveled. Let that sink in a minute. John, who has seen everything up until this point, marveled at the beast, at the woman on the beast. Why? Because she was enticing. She was seductive. And yet the angel said, no, 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 no. Let me tell you who she really is. The angel saw right through her, and he said, she is the one who lures Israel and the church from single-minded worship. So if we think about this woman, she's attractive. She's what we want. She has what we want. She's emulated, and she relaxes on the beast because she feels at peace. Well, we know that Babylon the Great is code for the city of Rome, as well as for the oppressive Roman Empire, just as Sodom is code for areas on earth that are particularly known for homosexuality. Let's look briefly at ancient Babylon and who this woman is, because she and Rome are the same. But if we look at Babylon, we can tell a lot about Rome. First of all, Babylon was founded on the Euphrates River last week. We talked about the Euphrates River being that boundary that's going to dry up and allow the kings of the east to invade. Babylon was founded by the descendants of Noah, and it was called Babel. We read in Genesis 11 that the, the people determined to build a tower to reach to heaven. Why? There's two reasons. First of all, they wanted to be famous. They wanted to make a name for themselves. 
And then the second reason is against God's commandment. They did not want to be scattered across the earth. They wanted to stay in the city and have a community where they, uh, everybody was dependent on one another for goods and services. Why? Because they were prideful, they were independent, they wanted to chart their own course. And I say that they were directly disobedient to God because if you remember, God made a covenant with Noah and his descendants, which was the same covenant he made with Adam and Eve. They were to be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth, and increase upon it. And that covenant with Noah and his ancestors in chapter uh, Genesis 9 was repeated twice. So the will of God was for them to go out over the earth, to, to be basically nomads, tribes, living in agricultural areas where everyone knew the family. You, you had your place. You were accountable. You were uh, productive. But no, the people of Babel said, uh-uh, we're not doing that. We're staying together in this city. What happens in cities? You can hide. You don't have to be accountable to family. There's so many people there you can get lost, which is what they wanted. So they refused to, to scatter. And so that's why God sent them different languages so that they could not communicate. And so they could not build that, that tower. Well, Babel grew into Babylon. And eventually it was ruled by King Nebuchadnezzar in 597 BC. We know that he's known for a number of things. Daniel had, the prophet Daniel had a lot of interaction with him, but one of the things that he did was that he destroyed Jerusalem and Solomon's temple. The exile of the um, intelligent, the smart, the wealthy, the accomplished, they were all taken to Babylon. And they were held for 70 years. It's called the exile. It was there that exile Daniel received his apocalyptic visions and dreams, so much of which is the foundation of Revelation. Well, God saw Babylon as the mother of prostitutes. Babylon was known for their unrestrained sexual acts. Homosexuality was considered normal. Sexual acts were not confined to bedrooms or alleyways in the dark of night. They were just out in the open. Prostitution was rampant. A father could consent to the paid rape of his wife and children. Needed a little money that weekend? Come on over here, guys. There were bride markets where women were sold as, as wives and slaves. Parties generally ended in orgies. Of course, prostitution is the evil twisting of Genesis 2.24 that says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, not sell her to be raped. And they shall become one flesh. Prostitution is the sexual act stripped of love, unity, and covenant. It is the depersonalization of a commercial bodily transaction. St. Paul had much to say about prostitution. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians 6.15, he said, Do you not know that your, members, your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Yet that is exactly what Satan seeks to do. By John's day, Rome, like ancient Babylon, was a sexual cesspool which tolerated every form of sexual deviancy, including child rape and bestiality. 
I googled um, some keywords about sexual activity in Babylon, and I was shocked what came up and that there were actually records of it. And I won't go into it because I don't want to put it in your head. And after a while, I just stopped reading. I thought, enough. But anything that you can think of that's dysfunctional and, and twisted was fair game there. And in Rome as well. So Rome was the great whore that John is actually writing about, though he calls it Babylon. It was the seat of power that seduced the empires of the world with false claims of security, wealth, independence, and justice apart from God. And it is that same lying temptation that Satan used to tempt Jesus in the wilderness. Matthew 4, 8 through 10 says, Again, this is an, again, this is another temptation. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Well, that's a lie right there. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The world, the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. What glory? If we go back and read about this chalice that the great whore has in it were all kind of abominations. The outside looks good, but what is inside will kill you. It's a false glory. Satan always offers a false glory. Rome and Babylon are, are models for a succession of worldly kings or governments who will, until the return of Jesus, receive demonic power from the beast on whom the great horse sits. So what will men do for power and money, which is the root of all evil? Well, we already know what they will do. They will sell their very souls. We only have to read the history of any empire or country or even today's news to know what man is capable of. Note in verses 13 and 17 that two times we hear that the people of earth are of one mind and they hand over authority to the Antichrist. That's an important verse because not only do the people of the earth hand over their authority willingly to Satan, but the kings of the earth do as well. That's what gives them their authority. Power at what price? In verse 13, they do it willingly. They weren't forced. They weren't coerced. They did it willingly. And so do we. Well, God gives them over to their desire. Eventually, he always does. If we will not repent, he will give us our desire. Their desire was to be ruled by the Antichrist. Be careful what you wish for. So one of the lures of Babylon and Rome was, of course, wealth. Currency was used to buy and sell, but also their coins acted <clears throat> like billboards or commercials or uh, proclamations for the rulers. We've already looked at one coin uh, earlier in our class. If we look at um, this next slide... You see, uh, the, the Caesar is Vespasian, and the woman sitting on the seven hills is the goddess Roma, and she is symbolic of Rome's power of world domination. Vespasian is important to us because of the date. It was Vespasian's son, Titus, who destroyed the Jerusalem temple in A.D. 70. So it is not a coincidence that Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon destroyed the first Jewish temple and Rome the second. Both of these empires are depicted in John's vision as the great whore. 
So Roma is a conquering and nurturing spirit of Rome. She rests at ease as well on her seat, secure in her power. In verse 7, John recounts the rule of the kings or Caesars of Rome and then describes the beast's power over those nations. He talks about seven Roman emperors, five of whom had already ruled and died. And we think those are Augustus, Tiberius, Gaius, Claudius, and of course Nero. Well, the people in John's day believe that Nero, who was said to have died, did not really die. And so they thought he was the Antichrist, and he was an Antichrist for sure. Uh, they thought he didn't die, kind of like people say, you know, I saw Elvis over there. He didn't die. Well, that was that language about is and is not and is to come. That's a direct mockery of Jesus who earlier in the chapters of Revelation is described as the one who was and who is and who is to come. In last uh, week's class, we read that he's already come, so it was already uh, relegated to just who was and who is, because he is come. Well, this is a mockery of that. They thought Nero would come back to life. They thought that he had received a mortal wound, which he did, and but he went and hid and really was still alive. Well, the last two kings are probably Galba and Otho, who had very short reigns, which we are told they only reigned an hour. Rome was finally overthrown in 476 AD by the barbarian Visigoth, and that was the end. And it's interesting that Rome had deteriorated and decayed so much so that even though their, um, their empire was 10 times larger than the Visigoths, and they had a much larger army, they still lost. Well, since then, Babylonian whores or empires and their alliances have appeared throughout history. There's been many such great whores. The great whore is a perverse contrast to the Revelation 12 woman who gives birth to Christ in the church and who was protected by God. This woman will not be protected by God. The whore is also a contrast to the bride of Christ who we'll meet in chapter 19. Eugene Peterson, who's one of the sources for this class, says that it is the tendency of the unbelieving world to run after Satan-inspired human power structures. Whore worship, which he says, is a continual threat to bride worship or the worshiping church. So in John's symbol system, Rome as Babylon is the opposite of the future New Jerusalem, which we will get to in our last class. In the end, however, John says that whore worship leads men to voluntarily give their allegiance to whatever great whore at the time is ruling. So that they can temporarily exercise worldly power and authority and benefit from their short-sighted economic gains. Isn't that sad? Don't all of us know you can't take it with you? Whatever authority you have, whatever power you have, whatever money you have, it's here, but it's not going with you. And yet that is the thing that men will voluntarily give their hearts to. It is only the believers in Christ and his authority and power that will be rulers, that will have the things that we value come with us when we die. Those are our good deeds. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 12, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. So it is the opposite of the world teaches. It is not in living and grasping power 
that we have life. It is dying to ourselves and our prideful desires for wealth and position that we truly become humbled enough to learn compassion and empathy, to grow in trust and faith, endurance, and good deeds, which will follow us. Remember that Jesus told the church in Thyatira, the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. If you want to be in authority, die to yourself, because that's the true way to the power of Christ. Verses 15 through 18 of chapter 17 ends with a prophecy that is really surprising. The fickle nations who voluntarily, willingly gave their allegiance to the great whore all of a sudden turns on her. They are not loyal to her. In fact, Scripture says they hate the prostitute. Why? We are told in verse 7, For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose, by being of one mind, we've heard that phrase earlier, and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. So let's think about that a minute. The, the great whore and all her luxury, she's, she's just a city. She's a government. She's a structure. Oh, but there's more power behind that. And what is that power? It's the devil himself. It's the Antichrist. It'd be like saying, you know, New York is the center of world markets. But through Satan's power, some other city arises and takes over the world markets. And now New York is nothing. Let's leave New York. Let's move. Let's move our company out. And we don't need to be here anymore. You see, the loyalty was never true. And so that's what happens to the peoples of the world. They, for a time, are, are enthralled with, with the, the woman and her power, but the real power is in Satan himself and the Antichrist. And so they throw down Babylon and run off to worship the beast, even though it was the beast that the woman sat on. There's nothing to trust about Satan and his works. So we see that they, again, we see this scripture, which we saw earlier in the chapter, talk about being of one mind. The Antichrist is so effective at luring the world that the people follow him with one mind. They're in unity. Why? Because they go back to Babel, the same reason. They wanted to stay together and make a name for themselves. Because they would not obey God and his will for their lives. So what did God do? He allowed them to turn on the prostitute. Then he sent them into confusion again, even though they were of one mind, because they think this time we got it right, we're going to win and, of course, we know what happens. They don't. God will use evil empires of this world for his own purpose. And they don't hesitate to turn on each other or come under the direction of the Antichrist. They think they are powerful and wise, but being under the power of Satan, they are completely deceived. God allows for a time the people of the world to come together in unity, but it is a demonic order that they seek, even though it suits God's purpose. God can use anything and uses everything for his purpose, even the works of Satan. Do you have any comments or questions on that chapter? Can you speak a little louder? They said, um, the quote from this book I read yesterday, it says, to seek the praise of men and women is to be tossed upon a sea of instability. Only to the degree we are seeking glory for God only are motivations changed. 
Yes. If we seek stability outside of God, we only find crashing waves. There is no, inst- there is no stability apart from God. It's really simple. We try to make it very hard. But only in Christ do we have life and freedom and power and real glory because it comes from him. Anybody else? Okay, let's go to chapter 18. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven having great authority. And the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven. And God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart, she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble. Cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine wheat, flour, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots and slaves. That is, human souls. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you. And all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas for the great city that was clothed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls. For in a single hour all this wealth has been laid waste. And all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and all whose trade is on the sea, on the sea stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying aloud. Alas, alas for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, 
and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Then a mighty angel took a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on the earth. Well, it sounds pretty wholesale, doesn't it? <laughs> Complete destruction. Note that three or four times the merchants and the rulers stood far off and wept. They didn't go and comfort the great whore. They didn't come anywhere near it. They stood far off away, wailing but not getting close. So this chapter begins with a bright, authoritative angel. I love the different descriptions of the angels. We get to know them a little more, who these, who these angels are. This one was bright, and when the angel comes, he brightens the world, which obviously is in darkness. This angel has authority. This angel is likely the archangel Michael, which brings light to the earth. And he proclaims that Babylon has fallen. So with the authority God given him, he made a statement that cannot be refuted. Babylon is fallen. It's over. This is a direct quote from Isaiah 21.9. So this fulfills... Isaiah, it says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, and all the carved images of her gods he has shattered to the ground. So back in Revelation 17, we, we see that Babylon, of course, is described as holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. This is also a fulfillment of Jeremiah 51 which says, she makes the nations drink of her wine. This cup is full of demonically inspired seductions that can be summed up as twisted, lustful desires that make men strive for power and wealth. Sex, greed, power, slavery, idol worship, child sacrifice, abortion, trafficking, demon worship, corruption, bribery, hatred, cruelty, sexual immorality, compromise, and every form of evil has been wrapped up in this tantalizing, glittering promise of wealth. Promise of luxury, of security, of safety, of religious zeal, of plenty. But the underbelly of this beast reveals the truth for those who marvel at the great whore, they will take part in her sin and receive her plagues. Discernment is needed. Then Jesus says in verse 18.4, I love it when Jesus breaks into John's visions. Here he breaks in again and he says, Come out of her, my people lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. And this is why, ladies, we pray for revival. So that the people of God will come out of Babylon. 
This is a fulfillment of Jeremiah 51, 6 through 8, which, which says the same thing. Flee from the midst of Babylon. Let everyone save his life. Be not cut off in her punishment, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance, the repayment he is rendering her. Remember we just read, pay her back double. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand, making all the earth drunken. The nations drank of her wine, therefore the nations went mad. Suddenly Babylon has fallen and been broken. Wail for her. And that is what the rulers and that is what the uh, sailors and the ship owners do. They wail for her. So we see in Revelation this form of lamentation, wailing not for God, for the things of God, but for the things of this world. Well, John's, John's readers would have been highly moved by this imagery because so many of them just uh, 25 years ago had fled from their homes in Jerusalem or in Israel when the Romans came in and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. They too fled. They too came out of, symbolically, Babylon. And this was a fulfillment of Jesus' words in Matthew 13, 14 through 18, which was a call to physically leave Jerusalem. This is not just symbolic leave the world, but leave Jerusalem. He says, but when you first see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are, who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, not enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field turn back, not turn back to take his cloak. In other words, this is an urgent cry, get out. Don't bother with your stuff. Leave it. Leave your stuff. Leave your luxuries. Leave your essentials like your cloak and get out. And this is what uh, we see God saying to those in Babylon. Get out. Jesus said, get out. Of course, symbolically, Jesus is also calling us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. Do not worship with the powerful and seemingly independent whore empires of this world. In Revelation 18.7, John quotes from the, the whore herself. So this is the first time we hear her speak. She says, I sit as a queen. I am no widow. And mourning I shall never see. She is self-assured. She is independent. She needs no man or God to look after her. She is a ruler. She is the queen. She will never mourn. She will never marry. She is no widow. She will never mourn because she believes that her future is always secure. She will always be queen of the hill. But, like King Nebuchadnezzar, who in Daniel 4 said something very similar, he said, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? But that very day, God struck him, and he became like a beast of the field, insane, and eating grass. And so too shall Babylon fall. God answers her boasting in verse 8. God says, For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. The great whore also reminds us, reminds us of another woman in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. 
She is referred to in both. Her name is Jezebel. And we read about her in the letter to Thyatira. She calls herself. Do you see the, the pattern here? The great whore calls herself a queen. King Nebuchadnezzar says, I have done all this. Jezebel calls herself in the letter to Thyatira to a church. This is a church woman. She calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Jesus accuses the church of Thyatira of tolerating. Think about that word. Of tolerating that woman, Jezebel. That's a direct quote. We're going to talk about Jezebel a little bit more. But in chapter 17 and 18, the word whore and the phrase sexual immorality is mentioned together seven times. And we know what seven. This is God's proclamation. This is a definitive whore and immorality go together. She is called a prostitute twice. And twice she is accused of selling slaves, or as the scripture then defines that, human souls. Don't you love that? That in the midst of all this abomination, John sees that these slaves are not commodities being sold and bought, which they are, but they are human souls. He humanizes slavery. Well, you may be thinking Rome is a terrible place. It was a terrible place for women and for children. And you would be right, because she deserved to be punished. But don't get too smug. According to many sources today, the United States is the number one leading provider of all pornography, which generates $100 billion a year. The U.S. provides almost 25% of all hosted porn sites. That is the largest number of hosted porn sites in the world. The next one is not even close. Great Britain is the next one, and they produce 5.40%. But we produce 25 the country that watches the most internet porn is the United States. The country with the highest number of Christians in the world is the United States. According to the Barna Group, which is a Christian research group, they recently produced a study titled Beyond the Porn Phenomenon. And they discovered that 54% of professing Christians, which included pastors in the survey, admit to regularly watching porn. The world, 68% of non-Christians admit to regularly watching porn. That is only a 14% difference between believers and non-believers. Ladies, what is wrong with this picture? This is Alabama. This is how we tolerate that woman, Jezebel. We are a corridor from the coast into the interior of our country for human trafficking. And Montgomery is a hub. And who are these people being trafficked? Lots of children. How many children are missing? that have come over the border? 
Are we tolerating that woman Jezebel? Does it make you want to cry? These, including a state trooper, talk about seeking Babylon. These were arrested in Montgomery for a sex trafficking operation. Oh, but we have a church on every corner. We're okay. We've got a lot of work to do. We've got to spread the gospel. Well, we've looked briefly at one evil, sexual immorality. And now let's look at another evil. The whore, Rome, Babylon, sold a great number of slaves. According to the British Museum and the World History Encyclopedia, between 10 and 20% of all the people living in the Roman Empire were slaves. And the majority of those slaves were women, especially young girls, because old women weren't valued. They couldn't, they weren't desired sexually, but the young girls were. One-third of the inhabitants of Rome were slaves. Talk about a society built on slavery. They couldn't function without their slaves. It would be impossible for that much of your population, let's say, to go on strike. <laughs> Everything would come to an end. That's a lot of slaves. Well, according to Anti-Slavery International today, there are approximately 50 million slaves worldwide, either through forced labor or forced marriage. Remember the Boko Haram scandal where they stole all those dear girls from their school and forced them to marry them. And you can be sure it wasn't the Genesis 1 and 2 marriage where a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife. It wasn't that at all. 25% of all trafficked people are children. And of the 50 million slaves today worldwide, 6.3 million are sex slaves. Well, this next statistic will shock you. I hope it shocks you. It shocked me. According to Fox News, the top three nations of origin, that means where the children and the people who are trafficked come from, the top three nations in 2018 were the United States, Mexico, and the Philippines. A lot of those People who uh, are taken from the United States are runaways. They've come out of the um, broken foster care system. They've been stolen. They've disappeared in cities. Human trafficking worldwide annually every year is a $150 billion industry. It is the second largest industry of the world. The first largest industry is not a corporation. It's not Coca-Cola. It's a drug. And the second is human trafficking. Are we tolerating Jezebel? I'm sorry this is a downer today. <laughs> but think of the contrast for next week. So, how can the country with the most Christians be the world leader in human trafficking, child sex workers, and pornography? Well, in my mind, I have identified the Thyatira Church that received this letter from Jesus to be the most like the United States. Will someone read for me um, the letter to Thyatira, Revelation 2. Who wants to read that? Revelation 2. 
And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service, and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her out onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come." The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken into pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you, Lyle. Thyatira is like every church in America. It is a mixed church. You have some who in it who are sexually immoral, who tolerate that woman Jezebel, and then you have faithful members who reject Jezebel and all her works. That is the sad truth about our churches. We are not exempt from the power of our culture coming into our church and destroying our members. This church that we're sitting in right now has decided to reject Jezebel as much as we can. Does it mean everybody in the church is perfect? No. Do some people in our church have problems with pornography? Yes. Are there sexual sins happening among our members? There are. But the majority of the church has decided we will not tolerate that woman Jezebel. So we have to remember that this letter was written to the churches at the time and to us as well. And so it behooves us, ladies, to be uh, very clear in what we will accept from the world. Well, the merchants who profited from commerce with Babylon or through any of our cities, New York, Chicago, Detroit, any city, what we allow in those cities are different from one another, right? What happens in in Chicago is slightly different than what happens in Montgomery. Why? Because the people have allowed it. We just had an election, which I'm not going to comment on other than to say there were abortion amendments. One state stood up and said no. Three said yes. Do you see the division? It's all throughout our country. We don't agree in America on what is right and what is wrong. Well, the merchants and those who are in power are always giving us financial reports, right? How many jobs do we create? What is, you know, what, how much money do we make this month? Everything hinges in America and around the world on money. So the merchants mourned and lamented that no one could buy their cargoes. 
which is ironic, isn't it? Didn't we just have a few chapters ago the mark of the beast, 666, which determined whether you could buy or sell? God said, it doesn't matter whether you have that mark or not. Babylon's dead. (laughs) And all that buying and selling stops. God always has the last word. Well, if we look at um, this map, Rome is up here. Okay? This is their port area. And the main port they came through is called Ostia. And this is the river Tiber. And then we have channels to get all these goods and services and slaves and prostitutes into Rome. It, the, we, the scripture tells us that they stood off and didn't come in to watch. And so once this is cut off, then Rome is cut off. You remember recently we had a similar situation worldwide of uh, supply chains being cut. And we all had runs on toilet paper. (laughs) And nobody could find uh, hand sanitizer. What's that? Baby formula. Baby formula. I mean, and it happened how suddenly? Very suddenly. One day you had toilet paper, and the next day the shelves were empty. Think about that on a huge scale for the how God has cut off Rome. Well, of course, historically, this hasn't happened yet, but it will. These people who lamented that the goods and services were no longer available, there's no more toilet paper, are the same people, the same type of people who lamented in Ezekiel 27 and 28. And so Revelation really is a fulfillment of Ezekiel 27 and 28. And I would encourage you to read those chapters. They're too long for us to read today. But they had a very similar situation. And they lamented. It was the port city of Tyre and the island of Tyre. And I'm going to just talk about Tyre for a minute. I I truly am going to run down this rabbit trail. I'm sorry, but I think it's interesting. In Matthew, well, let me go back. Let me read you just a tiny bit of Ezekiel. This is what Tyre said. I am perfect in beauty. I am a god. And I sit in the seat of the gods in the heart of the seas. Similar? Similar boasting? God said, hmm. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 11 when he referred to Tyre and Sidon, both port cities, and he referred to them as unrepentant. This is what Jesus said. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done. These are cities in Israel. Because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, that's where he did most of his miracles, will be exalted to heaven. You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on that day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. There is another interesting connection between Sodom and the actual woman, Jezebel. Jezebel was a heathen princess. She was the daughter of Ethbaal, king of Sidon's daughter. She married Judah's king Ahab. That's a problem. Israel 
and Judean men were specifically forbidden from marrying who? Any Gentile woman. Well, he marries her. Why? Because he gains a treaty. Again, that's, that's like Babylon, you know. What's in it for me? Well, she married Judas King Ahab, and she incurred Baal worship, which is, I mean, her own father had the word Baal in his name. She fed at her table 850 prophets of Baal and the goddess Asherah at her own table, in her palace, in Judah. And they were paid for from the taxes of Judah. These are the prophets that Elijah later kills after God sends down fire on his sacrifice on Mount Carmel. You can read the story of Jezebel and King, ah King Ahab in 1 Kings 16 through 21 and also 2 Kings 9. And I encourage you to read about her because she is a cautionary tale. So then we come to verse 21. There is a mighty angel that takes up a stone like a great millstone, and he throws it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. Again, I think this is probably Archangel Michael because he's referred to as mighty. Well, a great millstone is what they use to grind wheat, grains. A great millstone was likely four to five feet in diameter. It was usually one foot thick, and it weighed about a thousand pounds. Well, that's not going to just, you know, send waves in an ocean if it's thrown in. So this great millstone had to be many times larger. And it is a fulfillment of Jeremiah 51, which said, O oh Lord, you have said concerning this place that you will cut it off so that nothing shall dwell in it, neither man nor beast, and it shall be desolate forever. When you finish reading this book, which is the prophetic book of Jeremiah, tie a stone to it and cast it into the midst of the Euphrates, where Babylon was, and say, Thus shall Babylon sink to rise no more, because of the disaster that I am bringing upon her, and they shall be exhausted. You see how it's all tying in? We are also reminded of, of what Jesus said about the millstone that will be tied around the neck of one who would harm any of his little ones. Mark 9. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Drowning is far preferable to what's going to happen to that person who causes one of his little ones to sin. And remember, we are his little ones. The last thing I want to talk about is all those lists of things that will be no more in Babylon. And the last one was, there will be no more the voice of bridegroom and groom heard in you anymore. And I think that's really a devastating proclamation for any people to hear because of all the negative complications and implications that come from no more brides and bridegrooms. Ultimately, that means no more children, no more stable families, no more homes that will worship the Lord as a family. When marriage is not celebrated, societies dwindle. And we're seeing that in our own country. Marriage is a sign of a healthy culture. It is a blessing. 
but there will be no more brides and grooms in Babylon. It is a way of saying that God has withdrawn his blessing from them and that all that is left, if there's no brides and bridegrooms, then all that is left are widows and orphans. There's no more new life. Throughout scripture, God refers to Israel as his bride or his wife. In Isaiah 62, God said, but you shall be called my delight is in her. That's a name. And your land married. But no more for Babylon. Jesus refers to the church as his bride and himself as the bridegroom. And you'll remember in Matthew 9, Jesus said regarding fasting when one of his disciples, uh, or when one of the Pharisees asked him why his disciples didn't fast, this is Jesus' reply. Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The day will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Let's think about this even a little deeper. If there is no bride and bridegroom, the ruin of Babylon is complete. There's no redemption left for her. There's no chance of repentance and no way of new life. Why? Let's also think about who came out. Who came out of Babylon? The people of God. If the church is removed from the world, there is no one left to witness. There is no one left to call for repentance. There is no one left to be a restraining societal influence on that culture. And so... There are no more marriages in Babylon because the people of God have come out. They've taken with them the families, the marriages, the life, and all that is left is death. So in, in this judgment of Babylon, we see that it is complete. But I wondered, what was the last straw? What was the last thing that had to happen that God said, that's it, I'm done with you, Babylon? And I think it's the very last verse of chapter 18, which says, And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on the earth. Remember the cries of the martyrs who were under the altar of God and crying out, How long? Well, the wait is over, the time has come, and their prayers have been answered. Justice has been fulfilled. Any questions or comments? Sally. I can't hear you. It's Iraq. Mm -hmm. but, uh, this, but now the centers of power, the center of Babylon, could be anywhere in the world because it's whatever ruling power is ruling over the world. Um, you know, people have thought it was the United States. People have thought it's China. People have thought it's Russia. You know, it, but it's wherever that ruling power is. And it may be at the end time, at the very last of the end time, that one of these cities does rise up again. We just don't know. Anybody else? I just wanted to say, um, we may have just the seven churches in here. You're right. Nobody can dispute the, the um, accuracy of the word of God. But what if we wrote that yesterday? I know. I don't feel like it's valid. I know. Because I think at some point in our life, all of us will find ourselves in one of those seven churches. Yeah. And know that we need to repent of and know how we need to come back to the Lord and submit ourselves to Him. It's just so accurate to me that anybody could, I don't even care if anybody could dispute it. Mm -hmm. you know, 
Yes, so the relevance for today of the seven letters. Absolutely. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I want to close with us reading together as our, our prayer. This, this, um, this prayer that was written by a Zimbabwean pastor, a young man, a young Zimbabwean pastor, over a hundred years ago, they found this among his things, and he was martyred. So I love that these are his thoughts. This is how he prayed. And I thought it was beautiful, and we could pray it together. It's called The Fellowship of the Unashamed. So will you read with me? I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth need, colorless dreams, tamed vision, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudity, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on his presence, walk by patience, am uplifted by prayer, and labor by power. My pace is set, my gait is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way rough, my companions few. My guide is reliable, and my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, pander at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, until I've stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, preached up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes, till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stops me, and when he comes for his own, he'll have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear. Amen.